Good afternoon. It's, I always worry I'm going to get the day wrong. Tuesday, June 17th at 1237 on that clock. And we will reconvene for item number 10. Um, thank you all for joining us. This next item is an informational update on the conservation actions that urban water suppliers have taken in response to the drought. The governor's April 25th, 2014 executive order to redouble statewide efforts uh, in water conservation uh, directed the state water board to direct to request an update from urban water suppliers on their actions to reduce water use in response to the drought and assess the effectiveness of those actions. It further directed us to ensure that urban water suppliers that are not already implementing drought response plans are limiting outdoor irrigation and other wasteful water practices. And it provided the State Board with the authority to adopt emergency regulations needed to implement these directives. On May 23, 2014, staff sent an email to approximately 440 of the state's largest urban water suppliers requesting that they complete an online survey identifying current water shortage conditions in their jurisdictions and the actions they are taking to conserve water, including whether or not the supplier had invoked its water shortage contingency plan. The survey also requested 2014 monthly water production data for the first half of calendar year 2014 as compared to average monthly production for the previous three years. Today we're going to hear from staff on the results of that survey, as well as from our state agency partners, from water associations, and from forward-looking water suppliers about where we stand, what more can and should be done, and what actions the board should take in response to the drought emergency. So we have three panels uh, to start off the afternoon. Uh, state agencies first, then water associations, and then the water suppliers I referenced, along with a presentation from staff. We're interested from hearing from our panelists to get the discussion going, but also uh, other stakeholders and the public on the water conservation actions that are occurring across the state, as well as any ideas for any actions that you think we should take as we move forward to implement the April 25th executive order and contemplate developing emergency regulations. We're also very interested in hearing about the plans that are being put in place in case next year turns out to be a very dry year. Uh, this is definitely not the time to hope that it's going to rain this winter. That is absolutely not a strategy. In fact, we have to assume that it won't if we're to be prudent with our precious water resources. We're hoping to gain insight from all of you on what we ought to do, and then shortly we're going to choose how to act and what to do and how to use our authority uh, to steward our state's precious water resources. So I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank the folks who are on the web uh, joining us and uh, look forward to uh, the beginning of a very vibrant discussion, which will uh, be a top priority for us in the weeks ahead. So with uh, no further ado, who should I turn this to? Do, does staff want to say anything first, or first we'll start with our fellow agencies? We can, uh, I believe Peter, that the agenda was scheduled to begin with an overview by the Department of Water Resources and Department of Public Health. Okay, terrific. And then save our water. Okay, we're starting it that way. Terrific. Take it away, and thank you for joining us. Okay. Where? Oh, great. Mark Bartson. Come on up. Come on down. And then Nancy, you and Jennifer up next. Great. You're going to show us pictures and stuff? Yay. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Peter Brostrom with um, Department of Water Resources. And we're going to speak a little bit on uh, sort of long-term water conservation that has occurred progress towards the state's 20% uh, by 2020 goal, okay. and then some of the actions that DWR has taken and um, actions that have been taken by state facilities. So to frame this, a lot of today's discussion will be on sort of short-term um, you know, drought measures, water conservation measures, but thinking long-term 
The state has enacted in 2009 the 20 by 20 program. Um, in 2010, water suppliers in their urban water management plan reported their baseline water use and set water use targets for the years 2015 and 2020. But since then, there's been a lot of question on how the state has been doing in terms of meeting those goals. And the next time water suppliers are required to report would be in the 2015 plan, hmm. which now likely will not be submitted till the summer of 2016. So it would hmm. likely be early in 2017 that we could report on the full data set uh, in terms of progress. What we decided to do was, let's see if I go up, is to go out and try to survey progress and we contacted state, regional, and individual water suppliers to gather data on their annual GPCD. We received uh, data from 147 water suppliers. This re represents, they provide water to roughly 22 million people or 60 percent of the state's population. And their average baseline GPCD was 191 compared to a state average of 196. So they're roughly the, the same type of agencies. They're diverse across the state, Northern California to Southern Ca California. They tend to be a little larger than the average, um, but we plan to t continue to seek out and request data from other uh, water suppliers so that we can represent the state's progress both regionally and make sure that it's truly a representative sample of, of the state's progress. So th this data that, that comes in, this graph shows the red line across the top is the average baseline for all the retail water suppliers who submitted plans. That's 196 GPCD, and that baseline period can vary between water suppliers, but for most of them, it's roughly 1996 to 2005. Based on that average baseline, the state's 2020 goal would be 156 GPCD. And then the interim goal for 2015 is 176 GPCD. In surveying the water suppliers, um, we found that in 2013, for 147 water suppliers, the average GPCD was 157, which is an 18 percent reduction from their average baseline for this select group of suppliers of 191. The other data points are what those, uh, the water use for each year that the suppliers reported in their plans to show the the variation over time. So we see this as a significant reduction. Um, you know, the state is on good progress toward, you know, making the goal. All of it, it's difficult to attribute. People question whether all of it is due to conservation, the economic downturn had some effect on it, mm -hmm. but 2013 was the driest water year on record. and without it being declared a drought. So in ter you would expect water use to increase during a year like that, and yet the value is uh, still at you know, 157 GPCD. So that's our, um, the data we have so far on, on progress towards 20 by 2020. Um, speaking a little bit on what DWR has done in terms of drought and some of the state facility actions, um, this spring, we started to hold uh, drought landscaper workshops in partnership with UC Davis, local water agencies, and irrigation companies. Um, emphasis is on trying to work with landscapers who manage large landscapes on meeting drought restrictions. These have been held in both English and Spanish, and at the three workshops we've held so far, We've had over 375 attendees, and we have six more planned uh, through the summer. 
We've held uh, small water system workshops in partnership with the Cal Rural Water Association on leak detection and on drought preparedness. With, in partnership with the California Urban Water Conservation Council, we held two landscape symposiums. Uh, I know some of the board members uh, spoke at those with the goal of discussing how can we make sustainable landscapes the default or the normal landscape in California. Mm -hmm. And in early in March, in partnership with, um, with the Association of California Water Agencies, we held a, a drought water rate uh, webinar that was, uh, had 200 attendees online. And there was a lot of interest as the drought was unfolding on that issue. And then, you know, this summer, um, DWR has the $200 million available in IRWM funds for drought programs, and those applications are due July 21st. And then additional $19 million in water energy cap and trade funds, and the guidelines for those funds will be released uh, July 1st, or the draft guidelines. So on state facilities response, uh, following on a, the governor's executive order, um, agencies and department are reporting water use for their facilities on a monthly basis. And as anyone's gone by the Capitol lately, you can see state facilities are limiting or eliminating landscape irrigation, vehicle wash, and you know, water use in fountains. Uh, so state facilities are making an effort as well. And so that's um, what I have. And so thank you. I think you have questions. Go ahead. Uh, as I recall, the 20 by 2020 legislation called for a, um, a check-in in 2015 as to whether 20 percent was enough. Right. Is that still contemplated? That is still uh, contemplated and part of the suppliers will report their 2015 water use in their 2015 plans. And since they have to measure water use through all of, all of for the calendar year 2015, they probably will not submit the plans to DWR until July of 2016. But, uh, but are you considering changing the 20 percent? That's the question. I, are you going to look at it? or uh, We and, will and look at when, it at that when? time in the progress. In, uh, in 2017? And, or um, that's what the legislation calls for us to do after receiving the 2015 plans. Okay. So. Oh, so the legislation says you should, I just don't remember it precisely right anymore. Is it, it says that you should think about it after you receive the update or does it, Correct. could you do it before you got the updates? I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the specific language, but I believe the way it's worded is we're to submit a legislative report on, based on the progress reported in the 2015 plans. Mm -hmm. but, but since you're not getting the 15 plans until 2017, that's a little bit late, right? And that's one of the reasons right. why we've started to do the survey uh, to see the progress right. that, that people are making. So, yeah. Other questions? Can you, do you have a sense, um, you know, 157 is, 40? Anyway, it's better than over 200. Um, <laughs> it's still high. So what's your, what's your sense of the, do you have a sense from your survey work where the biggest chunks of reduction come from? In, in terms of regionally across the state or, or in terms of savings at uh, the household or, you know, Oh, the, from, uh, from water districts, not from the state facilities, but from... I, I think a lot of these savings are, are coming from um, inland areas where the uh, city of Fresno, who's recently installed meters, is showing great reductions, um, and, you know, other areas like that. Um, Coachella Valley has significant reductions. They put in a water budget rate system that is brought their water use down close to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. So I think in many cases it's um, 
the significant savings are, are coming from our more inland uh, utilities. So the big, they were, the big users that had higher per capitas have been able to make the dramatic reductions that bring the average down. Because I know San Francisco, for example, who don't have yards to speak of, is closer to 50 gallons a day now. That's pro probably at a residential level. Right. I think San Francisco, if I'm remembering right, uh, on across their I rarely praise San Francisco. So this is a area. big deal for my friends in LA. Yeah. Let me say that. But they, uh, I believe their 2013 GPCD was 87 oh. gallons per day. And so. So it's more than a dirt. Okay. You know, that's, um, but that's a reduction from a baseline of 98. So it's still, uh, you know, a significant. 10% or more reduction mm -hmm. that way. Um, Where's the highest water use now? Um, in terms of the entire state? Yeah, um, average. It's often, there's several districts that are kind of ranchettes um, and they, where portable, potable water is being used you know, on sort of a five acre parcel and some of those have uh, water use over 1,500 gallons mm. uh, per day. But it's kind of where they've included some of their agricultural water use mm -hmm. in their, their per capita uh, accounting. How about the best? What's the best that you've seen? Um, there's, there's some that are down in the 70s that are quite low, and often those are in Los Angeles and tend to be, I think, poor communities mm -hmm. with, without the landscape. Um, Interesting. So well, um, I think you touched on it, but I want to make sure I'm clear because with surveys, you want to make sure you're, you've got representative results. And so you have 147, and our survey had 420 water suppliers, so that's less than half of the population. So I wanted you maybe to reiterate, you know, how representative that is because I know People are going to, human nature is you're going to respond to a survey if you've got good news. <laughs> so I'm wondering how biased those results are in terms of, of an overall representation of the state. So we, are, we did not send out an email to all the water suppliers. We contacted regional groups and large, the KUA agencies provided us data. Um, again, this data represents roughly 60% of the, the state's population, and the starting baselines were roughly equivalent. It's not skewed towards the more efficient users or the high users. Uh, I think we can make it more representational. We plan to do sort of a random sample of those we haven't contacted, and our goal is to re release a report on this later this summer that will show both um, statewide numbers and regional uh, data in terms of water use and water reductions. I have one other question. Yeah, sure. Uh, have you identified a place or a, a mechanism for getting this information on a more regular basis without having to do this survey approach? Is there, is there any uh, agency or, or group or technique that you've, that you've identified where we could get this information more regularly? We have started to work with the Department of Public Health on, in the past, DWR sent out a public a water work survey and Department of Public Health has their annual water use survey. We've combined those this year for the first time um, the, the water use data is there. The sticking point, and I think maybe even some of the other agencies that will speak after us, some of these regional groups, is always the calculation of population data. And, uh, hmm. and so that's why we've tried to do a more select response where we know the agencies that are sending it in that they're accurately looking at what their population is because for many of these agencies where their boundaries do not match a municipal boundary, it, it's very difficult to come up with an accurate population. And often the best way is you get a benchmark in 2010 and then you calculate your years forward using a persons per connection for your service area. 
and I think as we go forward and as per capita water use becomes more of a metric mm -hmm. that all suppliers will use, we can better educate and inform water suppliers in uh, using, you know, correct population uh, uh, data. But it um, often where we've seen data that, that submitted the population data is a real, is often, uh, you know, sort of a real a problem in terms of these calculations. So. I can probably comment on that a little bit more once I get started. Okay, terrific. Uh, let me ask just one other question and we'll talk about this more in the course of the afternoon, particularly I suspect when we have some of our more progressive water agencies coming and talking about what they've been doing and how they've been able to do it and what they aspire to do. But um, I asked the question about the best numbers and it was very interesting to see that many of them come from communities that don't have um, outdoor, much outdoor irrigation. But in your survey and looking at what you got, again, this is a question I'll ask others, can you give one example of a community that you think has done something particularly innovative, noteworthy, impressive, you know, insert your favorite ad adjective? That you, if you were gonna, in your report, have sidebars of a case study of really good work, which I hope you will when you do your report, because people can relate to that more than average statistics. What, does anyone come to mind? Well, I think, and even today, I believe Eastern Municipal is gonna report uh, where, um, and their work on the water budget rate structure down there mm -hmm. has uh, shown significant reductions for a, l a large service area. Um, I, um, you know, I think here in the Sacramento area, there's uh, a number of agencies that are, um, you know, beginning, we're sort of, right. uh, you know, the drought of, or the Folsom Reservoir levels in January of 2014 really sort of drew their attention and now are very actively engaged in, in reducing water use. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a wide, I think, variety that we will report on, and, and some of this will come in our legislative report on the urban water management plans that, that we also hope to submit soon. Great. As well. Great. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Mark, take it away. Thank you. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. Me. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Mark Bartson. I'm the chief of our technical operations section with the Department of Public Health. Um, I head up a unit that, a section that has, oversees recycled water regulatory development. Um, and um, technical, some technical assistance and water treatment technology. Um, for the past two months, I've headed up our division response center for drought response, and so I've kind of expanded into this area, um, and I want to talk about some of the things we have. I think I'll start by, um, are my slides on there? I had, um, the, let's start by talking about the um, annual report from large water systems uh, that we receive. Uh, since it ties in a large water system annual report to the drinking water program. Um, basically, just tying into this last point about um, what information we do have, um, we've been collecting for as long as I've been with the department annual report information from water systems that included production data, um, pretty detailed. And for the last four or five years, we have that in an electronic database. And um, if you could go to page... Uh, Page seven, I think, um, just to show you what we've been gathering. We have um, hmm. across the top of there. We have uh, um, the maximum day uh, date in the month, the water produced from wells, surface water purchased, potable water, and sold to other public water systems. Then we have recycled water production, and uh, we've gathered that by month. And I, I know we've That's shared great. that data. And I, I think the good news is that we. We have it electronically for the last four or five years, and um, these questions about population are always a little bit, you know, pestering. And we, what we do always have is number of service connections, and we we sometimes see numbers, conversions that don't seem to make sense. Sometimes they make a little more sense upon closer look, like if there's a lot of apartment buildings mm -hmm. and so on. So that's an area where there always is a it's always a little tricky. Um, so we do have that data for. Real good response rate, especially for the larger systems, over I'd say a thousand service connections. We've started to, to develop some tools where we can really compare um, 
a, a specific water system with what's going on within their region and statewide. And some of that um, we haven't rolled out yet, but I think this is an opportunity to, to advance some of that and, and feed some more information back to water systems on, on how they're doing with respect to other utilities in the area or in the yeah. state. Um, I would like to go to page um, 18 of our document here just to show you what we're asking with respect to the drought. Um, if you notice on this document, it's a fairly lengthy document. It's, it's actually done online by water systems and they can save it as they go along. So it's, and they're very used to doing this and they understand the lingo and we, it's kind of evolved over time where the, the it's very, very familiar to water systems and they, they use it to, um, well, of course, report compliance, but also to kind of as a self-training tool for all the different areas of requirements. Um, but on page, actually page 19, we have the, the specific questions we put together for this year. Um, after our emergency response plan, we have um, questions you'll see on auxiliary power supply. Then a little further at the bottom of the page there, we start our questions on whether the first question is, do they have a drought preparedness plan? Then we go through a series of questions about what happened in 2013. Now keep in mind, this survey is always about the previous year mm -hmm. t traditionally, but we did include a few questions um, onto the next page, please, about what they anticipate um, going forward, uh, whether they anticipated going to mandatory rationing for the upcoming year. Now, we had to develop this early in this calendar, um, early in the calendar year and get it out and get it up for people to fill it out. So we. We weren't extremely ambitious. We wanted to make sure we asked at least a few of the right questions, but more importantly, we wanted to um, just get a baseline of information. And even though, of course, we're asking about the previous year, we can use this to um, identify upcoming problems. Now, of course, the most important thing we have within our organization is our 23 district offices and our local primacy agencies that directly regulate all public water systems in the state. And they have a working relationship, both as a regulator, technical assistance provider, and I think a lot of times, most importantly, is getting them in touch with other resources, talking to other water systems that are going through this, and um, pointing them in the right direction and helping them evaluate their systems. And I'll talk about that a little bit more with respect to smaller systems. So I think today you're gonna hear from um, some of the larger mm -hmm. utilities you're also going to hear from um, a few organizations that represent relatively smaller organizations as well, like Aqua. Their members are of a lot of different sizes. So um, broadly, we, def we um, divide the universe of water systems in the community, water systems as our highest priority. Then after that, the schools and the non-transient, and then the non-community systems that are um, businesses and so on that could, you know, if push came to shove could probably close if they, if they didn't have water. So we, we focus our efforts on the community water systems. Typically the smaller ones need the most help in evaluating um, where they're going. So um, I did want to see if anybody had any questions on our, the information we currently collect from larger water systems. Before I go into any of the smaller system issues, um, I think um, obviously we're sharing the information. We've coordinated our surveys more as we do more surveys, we found it's, of course there's gonna be some overlap and people understand that, but I think if the water systems see that we're sharing the information and, and sharing the survey results, that, that makes us all feel like we're really doing our job a lot better and they won't complain as much. Do, so do, do, that's do you, fine. I just have um, a couple of questions. I mean, presumably since you are their regulator, you have a better return rate, do you? Do they all, does everyone comply with this? I would say with larger systems, and historically we, we say systems over a thousand where we're, that we regulate probably the most closely, the compliance for submittal of this information is very high, well over 95%, and we can go back to them and, and actually tell them, look, we'll fill this out for you, but we'll bill you for our time, and that works really well. Um, the smaller systems, we, um, we have pushed it more. Some of our districts are very, have gotten really push for it and are at above 90 percent and others probably lag a little bit but um, there is a pretty powerful incentive because we do have the authority to require um, a status report on the water system as a permit condition and this is basically yep. a yearly status report so most of the water systems have figured out that we can enforce this and in some cases we have so um, I think our going looking at above 200 service connections we're probably at over 85 percent of submittal 
um, rough guess. Mm -hmm. Smaller than that, it's, it's coming along. Um, let me just mention that of the systems under the LPAs, the local primacy agencies, the counties, mm -hmm. um, in the last couple of years, we've, um, we've really pushed the LPAs to require this, essentially required that they require it, and that's pushed the, um, the rate to a lot higher level. So we're doing better. And I think once systems submit it once, it's really not that hard. The, the tools we have are fairly straightforward. So I think that's the good news. That's great. Um, I did want to mention we have a, um, a strong effort with the smaller systems to help them um, evaluate where they are. Um, with those systems, a lot of times, and I'm speaking here of communities of less than 200 connections that probably don't have a full-time employee or maybe even a part-time employee, um, we felt the most important thing to, that we can do is give them tools to evaluate in conjunction with, with our staff or their engineers or third-party providers like you heard about uh, mention of California Rural Water Association. We're working with the Rural Community Assistance Corporation that's putting on drought contingency workshops right now. So with the smaller systems, um, if you could pull up the, um, the small water system drought management planning uh, checklist. Um, tool we've we've developed um, basically not so much a form to report what they've done as a as a guidance document to help them through the thought process if they're trying to figure out to what extent they have a problem and we ask um, let's see as we scroll down through that uh, just there's some basic things of gathering information on assessing their supply identifying alternatives are you going to have to haul water this year basically gathering information to talk to other people and evaluate amongst their experts and themselves, what is their current status and where do we go from here? So um, then at the very bottom, um, page seven and eight, we have a section on um, just asking them about conservation measures. And, and a lot of this might not look very ambitious and that's, that's partly by design with these smaller systems. We want them to be talking to the people that could help them, whether it's our regulators, their peers, technical assistance providers and their consultants and so on. Um, and um, we find there's a lot of water systems that will share resources if we can get them um, pointed in the right direction. Um, I did want to mention too, we are of course working real closely with the Office of Emergency Services on, on tracking the systems that are in either critical or very vulnerable um, or vulnerable condition. Um, currently the list of those is thankfully less than about 50 or so, but there's a whole bunch of course of systems that are on the fringe of that that we'll be tracking. So the good news is uh, right now we're not dealing with too many systems that are really bad, but we all know that's going to evolve and change this year. Um, we also have a $15 million drought um, emergency fund for systems. Um, right now we have eight or nine systems that have, um, have uh, funding agreements under that. We are hoping to keep, to, to keep the, um, the fund projects that are relatively small we love the $20,000 projects. It's not very many of those. Our, kind of our goal is hopefully under half a million dollars per project, but it's, that's kind of what we'd like to do. And um, there's a lot of work with respect to prioritizing and what happens if, you know, when, if and when we run out of that, that um, money. So fortunately, at this point, we have, um, we're not too far into it as far as that funding. Um, I did also want to mention that um, under my staff we have our recycled water unit that we helped the state board of course recently with mm -hmm. the general order um, and I think we have a really good working relationship with your staff and we understand that we need to streamline our, um, our review process as much as possible. The good news is we've made a lot of progress on that before so I think we just have a few more steps to go and um, of course our goal is always to make sure public health is protected so that there's no in no incidents that you know, raise unnecessary concerns that, that the industry follow you know, the practices that, that they've helped establish on proper use of recycled water. So I think we have a good cooperative relationship both between our agencies and industry. Um, so yeah, the one final thing I wanted to mention is um, as far as contingency planning, we are working with our technical assistance providers, Rural Community Assistance Corporation mm -hmm. and California Rural Water Association too. Mm -hmm. We have a series of those going on right now with uh, Rural Community Assistance and we're however many more we need to do in the fall, we'll do. So we're kind of shifting a lot of the things we 
always do with technical assistance, kind of focusing them more on drought and the things people really want to know about. And um, you know, we have a lot of resources that we just are trying to focus all in the right direction here. So um, that's a basic status report on what we're up to. Oh, one, one final thing I do need to mention is that one of the side effects we see when as systems start running out of water and turning to other sources is this question of alternate sources, maybe an old agricultural well, um, so maybe a, a well that's not as deep as you'd like it to be. So our, what, we, what we're doing at a local level and try to make sure we're consistent statewide is to make sure when we're reviewing any kind of alter, um, alternative source that we provide additional mitigation measures in terms of chlorination, monitoring, that we really know what we need to know about that source so we're not you know, creating another problem and so on. So that's, that's kind of one of the you know, side effects of this. And, or a system maybe has to turn on a well with marginal or high nitrates and right. needs to figure out if they can blend it or do public right. notification. So we need to do all of those things right to you know, really address that issue. So Exactly. Thank you. Very complex. Questions? I actually have one of Peter, in light of the presentation that was that Mark just made, have you looked at the last five or six years that are electronically available? And um, I, I understand the population issue, so discounting that one, is that, uh, why aren't we just, why can't we just use that? Well, I mean, <laughs> you can use that for um, for the water supply. Mm -hmm. But then you w we would have to do our own calculations for the population if we're putting it in. Oh, if we're doing B B uh, GP per capita, yeah. GCP, which is, is what you know the right. 2020 program is based on. Okay, so that's that's the main challenge. It's not so much water use and it, tracking it. Is is it going down or up or it, does it is it very similar to Mark? Uh, the what we see? Uh huh. Production yeah, I, use. Oh, I, we have seen some reductions, certainly even before this year. Um, we're just actually getting the data in for 2013. It was okay. due. Um, see, the report is actually goes live. I think about March 1st, mm -hmm. and then the water systems have a couple of months to get it filled out. And mm -hmm. um, we're in the process of getting all the data together. It was all due, I think, a couple of days ago. And oh, so, okay. in the next couple of weeks, we'll have the data for 2013. Great. But we've seen. A downward trend on the, for the most part. Great. Right. Well, that's something to look forward to in terms of analyzing it. Do you have any favorites, anecdotally, stories of folks who've been able to um, well, reduce? Or are you looking more at making sure people have adequate water? I think, um, I mean, we see the recycling efforts in you know, Orange County and so on that are pretty amazing in Monterey County. I, I think, um, yeah, there's some extremely motivated folks down there, and we're, of course, working on the um, groundwater recharge um, regulations and starting to look at indirect potable reuse. San Diego with their surface water augmentation, the work they've done on that. And mm -hmm. they've certainly done, um, um, having gone through a number of years ago, uh, a first attempt at the surface water augmentation. They, they've they led the way in terms of um, identifying what people are really concerned about and probably how you have to do an effective public outreach and um, to um, explain what the situation is and, and maybe part of it is people you know need time to get used to the idea mm -hmm. that um, you know water supplies are very limited so um, I mean personally I kind of like the you know getting rid of lawns and so on I mean I mine's been gone for a while and I, I know Santa Rosa and Sonoma County has done a lot of that I I like those personally I you know it's a lot easier to take care of anyway it's a, a twofer We've talked That's a lot right. about outdoor use, That's really. but on, on indoor use, um, and, and other folks can talk about this too. I'm sure you have a lot of information, but you know there have been there's a lot of momentum in the indoor use area, and you know standards for appliances I think have had a huge impact mm -hmm. uh, in terms of then when you look at sort of the trend, and you know when we talk about GBCD reductions, you know isn't aren't those inst um, you know built-in turnover appliance issues having a pretty big impact as well I think they've had a, a large impact and I even the new washing machine standards that that came in and I believe in 2012 will probably reduce per capita water use 5 GPCD from those standards alone 
these uh, new standards coming in. That's interesting. Then you would have a saving at your wastewater treatment plant, too, because remember we knew, sorry, I'm looking at Martha, we knew what time of day people did their laundry on average in L.A. because of the slug we would get in the wastewater program. And water cons we invested in water conservation generally because we knew it was going to improve our treatment at the other end. So the washing machines are a huge deal. Washing machines, you know, even the change yeah. in toilets, you know, now going from even 1.6 to 1.28 or 1, or even there's some out there at 0 0.8. Um, and they work those, now. Those are those long-term measures. You can't do a lot of those in one year for a drought, but over time, those rebates and those conversions or uh, really make a big difference in terms of water use. I know in, term, in Santa Rosa, and I'm, I know a number of communities where they're charging, your um, sewer charge is based in part upon um, your how much water you use during the lower right. months. That seems to have a big impact I, from my own experience, and I, I'm kind of curious what percentage of larger cities have a rate structure like that or, or wastewater districts where you pay, you know, based, your, your wastewater rates are based on, in part, on how much water you use, is that fairly common? Is that becoming more common? It's fairly common, but then in areas like LA where we had a lot of outdoor irrigation, we actually would do fee cuts if people showed that their half of their water use was used yeah. outdoors, not thinking about Harder. the long-term yeah. consequences. Hard to identify the base rate right. that's actually indoors, yeah. And I'll just mention, if I may, our Energy Commission has a proceeding going on right now looking at the next generation of standards for water use for uh, fixtures uh, for uh, toilets, urinals, and uh, faucets. Good. Great. Other questions? All right. Hopefully you'll be able to stay around. I oh, sure. Thank yeah. you very much. That's uh, going to be a treasure trove of information, which is terrific. So with that, let's hear about the Save Our Water campaign. I should have had you come up to my office first. I have your three boards across yeah. my wall. Glad you could use it. Yeah, it's great. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk about one of our favorite topics, that's Save Our Water. Um, you know, we know that the public, when asked to take action, will do so. We're seeing great willingness on the part of the public to do what they can do during this drought time. And that was really the whole sort of idea behind Save Our Water when it was established actually back in 2009 uh, during our last drought. So that's where the program began. And I should have said I'm Jennifer Persike with the Association of California Water Agencies, by the way. So that's when the program was established. Uh, it's a statewide umbrella program. Oh, Nancy, I think I need my clicker over there. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, statewide umbrella program, uh, public education, public outreach on both why we need to conserve and how to conserve. Very important, both of those things. And as I said, formed in 2009, it is a very unique program in that it is a partnership between the Association of California Water Agencies, which administers the program, and the Department of Water Resources. We really work as one team to maximize our resources, and it's, it's just a great interaction because of the different roles that we play that in something like this really come together and make the program work and maximize the messaging that we can do. So that's been excellent. Um, originally, the funding came from Prop 84, also with infusion of support from aqua and local water agencies and we've made that last for like five and a half years and nancy will touch more on that the program is research based everything that we do is based on statewide public opinion research which i'll just tell you what we learned from that is that again public willing to conserve doesn't really know that they use more outdoor than they do indoor so that's been a huge focus of Save Our Water, to focus on outdoor. And you'll see that throughout everything we do in the program. Um, started in drought, as I said, but we've shifted um, 
to the support of 20% reduction by 2020, although now we are really returned to drought mode during this serious situation that we're in. So it's a very robust program in that we use every avenue that we can think of pretty much on a shoestring um, to get the word out. And we have two key audiences for this program. We have California consumers directly. So you'll see that the look and feel of the program is really intended to appeal to regular Californians. Um, but we also, a very important other audience for us is, are the California water agencies. This is the umbrella program, but we want to provide every tool we can think of to those agencies that sort of helps us to standardize, standardize messaging, but also to provide tools and things that they may not be able to come up with at the local level with the resources that they have at their disposal. So those are the two key audiences. So we've done a number of things to get the word out. A couple things I wanted to mention before I launch into the picture of the website here. We've partnered with Sunset Magazine, Bed Bath & Beyond, Orchard Hardware Supply, um, all kinds of entities. We're, we're looking at other opportunities so that we, we know they reach out to consumers, so we want to use their channels to do that. Right now, we have what we call about 500 partners. Those are agencies and organizations and associations, you name it, that we push information to, and then they push it out even further than, than we're able to do directly. So this is a, a kind of a nice shot of our website. Um, again, it, not as friendly as it was when we were in the 20% support of 2020, but it, it clearly helps the public understand what is on our collective plates right now in terms of the drought. And you'll see on the bar above, um, in particular, a toolkit. And as we move down here, you'll see a number of tools that are available to agencies and organizations that we've developed. Again, to complement local programs, we know there's many, many regional and local outreach programs going on out there. We don't want to conflict with that. We want to provide things that they can use to get the word out. This was a very important graphic, we thought, uh, because it directly tied to the governor's ask of a 20% reduction that he made of all Californians. So we put this together so that, you know, anyone, your neighbor, anyone could see this and understand how they could be part of that. How do I reduce my use by 20%? We did this in both uh, English and Spanish, um, indoor and outdoor options. And these pieces are intended to be sliced and diced, and they have been, and we have some examples of that later. Um, so that agencies can take any of these components and put them, them together in any way that they choose. So we pride ourselves on the program that wants to be ripped off. We want all of our stuff to be ripped off and used. Mm -hmm. We charge for nothing. Um, we just want the material to be used well and get the word out. So you can see here that those earlier graphics have been turned into posters and flyers. Very simple, eye-catching graphics. And there's the example of the Spanish, uh, Spanish flyer and poster. Um, this year, we were excited to kind of come up with something to pique Californians' interest and tap into their ethic and their attitude that is unique to Californians. And that is that Californians simply don't waste. That's the message we're using this year. Um, throughout all of our materials, all of the various campaigns that we have running. And we have really moved to some tongue-in-cheek graphics. We've heard a few comments, for example, about the wipes. But our, <laughs> our theory is that to catch the public's attention in 2014, you gotta, you got to turn up the heat a little bit or it, it, it won't even get noticed. So that was kind of our approach but we're getting our message out trying to use some humor but to make the point that in this year we're expecting different behavior from californians so that's the idea behind that then again getting back to this toolbox so all of these things are available to public water agencies and other organizations to do whatever they would like with these graphics and we also help adjust them to the format that they might need for whatever it is they're doing. So for example, if they're doing a billboard, we will help size the billboard. They have to pay for the production at the local level. 
Uh, restaurant and hotel cards, believe it or not, there's still many places outside of Monterey, because Monterey, they're everywhere, where they still need this kind of support uh, collateral. So we've developed that, again, for any entity's use. And here's just a few examples of how some of our water agencies have been using the material. And there are literally dozens and dozens of examples around the state for how our materials are being used. But here's a few. You can see where they've pulled out those graphics directly and just plugged them into what might be a bill stuffer. Um, they're using, and it's hard to see the bottom right-hand corner, um, our PSAs and just putting their name on it. And Nancy's going to touch on the PSAs. Um, and the other little newsletter piece that we wrote, they plopped that in, the city of Napa, into their materials. So again, the whole idea behind this is to complement those local efforts, but to ensure that everyone is hearing the message. It's a statewide umbrella message. Um, so I'm going to, at this point, turn it over to Nancy, who's going to give you more detail about specific initiatives for this year. Before Nancy, before you begin, yes. I'd like to make a motion that we replace all of the flyers in the restroom <laughs> with these materials. Are we going to have a discussion about insects and where to put them when you kill them? I love these. Uh, yeah, these are good. We should. You put have these to go the into our restroom. Yes. and and observe. I that did. I noticed the time is now. I think the time is now, but also we don't uh, destroy insects. insects. It's not that we don't destroy them, it's if you destroy them, you throw them in the trash, not right. flushing them down the toilet, which people do <laughs> because they freak out by a little bug. Yeah. <laughs> well, waste, it wastes the whole flush. It's not good. Worse than the, the wipes. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what's people. interesting, to, real quick, though, just to support what this presentation actually is, when I was on the North Coast, which was a unique experience this year to talk about drought on the North Coast, you know, the rainforest of the, of the state. And folks were simply, the questions that I received were, I need, I know why, I need to know how. Exactly. This, we need more information about how to achieve this. And they even gave the example, like for instance, I'm not shaving, you know, a man with a very big beard, he said, no, I'm saving water that way, you know, why don't you do something like that? And I didn't mention save our water, but I didn't realize, you know, how, how detailed the menu is. And Send it's excellent. Yeah. Well, two, two summers ago, we went up to the Humboldt County Fair because we felt like it was time to reach the North Coast with the Save Our Water booth and materials and so on. I'm Nancy Vogel. I'm Director of Public Affairs for the California Department of Water Resources. I threw this little girl's photo in here to remind me to tell you that we do hit a lot of community festivals and fairs, and we're planning this year to be at the State Fair the California State Fair for, with two exhibits. We'll have our award-winning Waterwise garden beds in the farm section of the Good. State Fair, so come by. We will also have a